Oh my god, I cannot believe And so what now I'm... you know why the misinformation has been so necessary, has been such a key part of the strategy, because the truth does not favor Amber Heard, and At everybody all. knows it. Five documents were unsealed by Judge S. Karate's July 13th order in the Fairfax County Circuit Court. We have now obtained the copies of those documents. They have been uploaded to my website at andreaburkhart.com where you can find all of them. You do have a YouTube channel and it has, <laughs> it has been a subject to controversy. So walk us through that. What was the, what was the purpose behind um, starting your YouTube channel? I mean, because I, I've got to ask, did you, um, did you start your YouTube channel to spite Amber Heard? <laughs> <laughs> I did not. In fact, um, I, I, I was sort of had to be talked into starting the YouTube channel. When I first started doing commentary, when I did it on video, most of the time it was with Colonel Kurtz. Uh, she's the first one who invited me onto her channel and, and had me back several times. Uh, and through that, I kind of met some other people and made some appearances on, on other channels as well. When the case went to trial in Virginia, uh, I was going on Rakita, I was going on Legal Bites, uh, these other places to follow the, the stream. Oh, I bet what Elaine is arguing on this one is that it's not proper impeachment because she is factually more or less taking the same position that she did take in the deposition, that it was her that was trying to escape into the bathroom, not Johnny. And so it's not a prior inconsistent statement. I don't know um, what kind of flexibility she's she's going to have with that, but that's I'm sure what what Elaine is is trying to bring up here. And just had a lot of encouragement from people that you know you really need to start your own YouTube channel. I had always kind of been resistant to it because I just never really saw that as as my thing. But uh, what happened to kind of change my mind was uh, Isaac Barouche's cross-examination <laughs> because I watched that cross-examination unfold and it was a master class in what not to do. Daniel, are you familiar with Amica cream? <laughs> Amica? Amica? Yes. <laughs> okay. And so it just was one of those spontaneous bits of inspiration that sometimes come into your life that I knew, I just knew I needed to make a, a video or a series of videos breaking down exactly how bad this cross-examination was. So that's why I started a YouTube channel was literally because Isaac Baruch rocked his cross-examination so hard that I just had to tell the world how awesome it was. So it wasn't a spite on the hood, just to clear that up. <laughs> Few, few degrees from spiting Amber Heard, but you know, if Amber Heard uh, is resentful, uh, you know, that's just the cost of doing business, I'm afraid. <laughs> what is your stance on people discrediting lawyers that are on YouTube, but not doctors, for example, carpenters, for example, uh, etc.? Like, do you think this is a social thing in regards to lawyers that they have like a certain threshold to meet or is it just people feeling butthurt about not getting their way <laughs> well i i think it's it's a combination of a lot of those things i think it's certainly sour grapes it's it's self-serving criticism you know when 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 on the extremely rare occasions there are lawyers that will side with amber heard because they're wrong nevertheless they'll go out in in public and and you know, support her her legal positions. You're a victim. Mm. Here we go, CSI. Uh, then these critics are are perfectly fine with that. These lawyers are lauded. They're amazing. They're the most intelligent people in the world. So there there's a lot of transparency with that. I don't take that type of criticism seriously at all. Uh, you know, the reality is, lawyers, uh, we have sort of a mixed reputation <laughs> in the world. Old, you know, not everybody loves the profession. That's understandable. Most of the time, if you have run afoul of the of a lawyer, it probably hasn't been a good experience in your life. So I, I understand we're not necessarily the, the most loved profession, and I'm not going to be the person to change that for the world. Um, but I do believe in 
the rule of law. I believe in the, the system that, that we try to operate under. And I think it's really important uh, for people to understand it, to understand how it works, what the rules are, so that they can see, are people being treated fairly by the system? Are their claims getting a fair shake? Uh, if you don't understand the rules of the game, then it's really hard to to understand. You know, if I was if I was watching the trial without a legal education, it would be like the equivalent of probably like me trying to watch a cricket game, you know, and have any idea of who's winning, you know, or or what the score is. I mean, I just I would have no no way to be able to to make sense out of it. So that's really what I'm trying to do with my channel is to just pull back the veil on some of the obscurity that there is in the laws and in the legal system so that it can be more accessible to everybody. I feel like in your answer, there was a, a little bit of uh, jabs and stabs at uh, Yell Boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to find out your stance in regards to cameras in the courtroom. But before we mm -hmm. go into that, what is the procedure usually for cameras in the courtroom? Is it something that a uh, party can make on their own volition or is it something that is decided ultimately by a judge? I have never seen a party request cameras in the courtroom. I, I, I suppose it's not impossible that that could happen, but I've just never seen it. It comes from media requests. Media are the ones with the cameras. They want to bring them in and, and be able to, to get film or to get a live stream or, or whatever. So they're the ones making that request to the judge. It is the judge's decision whether to allow the cameras in the courtroom or not. Oh. The judge may or may not solicit input from the parties on whether that's appropriate or not. Uh, but it's literally just that. It's input. It's their opinions. They aren't binding on the judge. It's ultimately the judge's decision. Oh, so it wasn't that I just woke up one morning and, uh, and decided, oh, I'm going to have cameras in here. So judge make it you happen. Know? I'm going to have cameras in the courtroom. Yeah, no, it was it was not it was not up to Johnny. And I've also seen uh, some some sort of strange comments about how Johnny took it to Virginia because cameras are, are allowed there. Well, cameras are allowed in most states now. <laughs> it's Including not, California. not really <laughs> uncommon anymore. California even allows them. They just rarely, you know, rarely actually do it because they had such a fiasco with with the OJ Simpson yeah. trial. <laughs> but um, federal courts do not allow cameras uh, there. That is starting to change. There's been a pilot program for uh, a few district courts uh, to have certain proceedings uh, you know, camera can come in and, and they can be they can be streamed or televised, but uh, it's still very small. Courts in general uh, are, are very conservative. They, they don't tend to like cameras. There tends to be a perspective that one, it just it, you know, can make the, the process a circus like we saw with with kind of the OJ trial with the Michael Jackson trial. Um, they didn't have courtrooms in it, but uh, cameras in it, but they had, you know, obviously massive public Hello. attention to yeah. it. Yeah. And so it's just anytime there's a lot of media attention on a case, things things get a little bit crazy. Uh, they are concerned that people are going to change how they act in the courtroom because they're aware of the cameras there. That was a big criticism of the judge, Judge Ito, in the O.J. Simpson case. There was kind of a perspective, a sense that he might have been a little performing a little bit, knowing that the cameras were there. So the, these are things that judges don't like. They they consider the dignity of the courtroom uh, very important, and and so the presence of the media kind of I, I don't know befouls that. I guess <laughs> personally, I am an enormous advocate for cameras in the courtroom. I am an advocate for government transparency. Period. Like my view is that if the government is doing it, we should be able to know about it and the exceptions to that should be so extremely limited as to almost never come up uh just my personal opinion but you know i'm 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 over here in america and i don't like tyrants i don't want my government to be in a position of, of being a tyrant so uh cameras in courtrooms i think are, are very important again not just because people want to see what's going on in this particular case, but so that we can understand the process and we can see for ourselves the same things that the jury saw. We can see when you just read a transcript or you re read a report of a case on a dry page, you, you don't get the flavor of what is happening because you don't see 
how are people behaving while these words are coming out of their mouth? What tone are they using? Uh, what sort of weird looks are they shooting at the jury? For example, so <laughs> had we not had the cameras in the courtroom, uh, it's very likely that we would have a, a you know a different impression of this case because so much of of what we saw was that nonverbal type of communication that we understand on an intuitive level. We that's how we relate to people, um, but you lose that if you don't have if you don't have that camera there. On the, um, understood and to and to even add to your point in regards to um, the transcript thing because uh, because we know that there was two litigations that happened here one was without cameras and one was with cameras one had mm -hmm. just transcripts and one didn't have transcripts uh, 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 sorry one had transcripts and cameras so we, we uh, just to correct myself so um, if, if looking at the UK case because you followed that um quite a bit did you follow that from the from the get-go or was it yes i i didn't cover it i i found it while it was going on i actually saw uh, nick wallace live tweeting it and so i i started i started following that and uh i became just through that process sort of integrated into the conversations that were going on i remember the first thing that I ever said on Twitter about this case was that I had represented murderers that I liked more than Amber Heard. <laughs> and that was, uh, you know, quite popular amongst a certain uh, segment of Twitter. Whoa, so, whoa, whoa, one second for a bit. Why, why did you make that comment, by the way? I actually want to know. Because it was true. <laughs> what murderers were you working with that is a lot more likable than Amber Heard? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> she just, you know, comes across as just so incredibly unlikable to me. Uh, I, I've, you know, I've met people like her, just these, these very difficult, very negative, very vengeful, very, uh, you know, about themselves types of people. Um, a lot of women who end up in the criminal justice system have personality disorders. Um, it's one thing, we have a massive over-incarceration problem in the United States, in my opinion. Uh, but when it comes to women, it does a pretty good job of selecting for these, these types of people that uh, just have these ingrained problems with their behavior. And so you recognize that very easily. It's very easy to see that in Amber Heard. Uh, and so, yeah, these are not not easy people to, to be around. So, yeah, I've met murderers that are that are charming people that are likable people. Uh, you know, they're they're not so bad. You could you could sit and have a, a good conversation with them. I wouldn't want to sit and chit chat with Amber Heard. Hell no. <laughs> You're, you're gonna get clipped so badly for that murderous comment. You're gonna get clipped so badly. Johnny Depp's UK witness statement. He says, fundamentally, the signs that Ms. Heard began to demonstrate then became the full and developed aspects of her character that I came to know during the incredibly unhappy time when we were together. She is a calculating, diagnosed borderline personality. She is sociopathic, she is a narcissist, and she is completely emotionally dishonest. I am now convinced that she came into my life to take from me anything worth taking and then destroy what remained of it. Indeed, later in our relationship, when we sought the help of a marriage counselor, the marriage counselor confirmed to me that Ms. Heard had a borderline toxic narcissistic personality disorder and is a sociopath. It was further explained to me that Ms. Heard's projection of emotions is extremely exaggerated. She will always overreact and she simply cannot be wrong in any circumstances. She invariably accuses other people of the bad things she herself has done. The same has been said to me by my private doctor, David Kipper. So you're saying that's basically what it, what it might come down to, or at least uh, that's going to be a big component of it is, that, is basically adjudicating her, her mental state, perhaps. That clearly seems to be what, what Johnny Depp is trying to do with this, this independent medical examination. Now we can go into your unsealed docs and mm -hmm. it has, it, 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 <laughs> I just got to come right out and say it. The minute it was uh, pu published, there was a lot of commentary around it. A lot mm -hmm. of publications joined in. Some publications even took it to mean that 
took so many and misstated so much of the document. So first and foremost, what is an IME? So the IME is the independent medical examination, and it's a it's a process that Virginia has. Some other states have it as well. When somebody's medical or mental health condition is at issue in a case, then there's a process to bring in uh, somebody to do an independent evaluation of them. So that happened for Amber Heard in this case because she claimed that because of this uh you know, abuse she supposedly suffered from from Johnny that she had gotten PTSD and she had suffered all of these symptoms and that was part of her basis of, of her damages. So she had very clearly put her, her diagnosis, her psychological condition uh, at issue in the case. She then turned around and kind of tit for tat wanted to do the same thing with Johnny but the problem was Johnny didn't claim to have PTSD that was caused by Amber. He didn't put his, his medical condition at, at issue. Uh, he just claimed that she hurt his career. So they, they were apples and oranges in, in terms of, you know, what relevance really uh, it, it had to the case. So since Johnny hadn't put it at issue, it, it doesn't get triggered. Uh, there was no basis to, to order one for him. There was, however, a very clear and obvious uh, and correct basis to order <laughs> one for Amber. Okay, so is it a it, 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 is it an admission of liability that you did not suffer any injuries because <laughs> because you did not No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's at best an admission that you are not claiming injuries for a diagnosable medical or mental health condition. Oh, good. Period. Thank, <laughs> thank you for clearing, for clearing that up because I, I, I felt I was going uh, insane there for a minute thinking, whoa, like... <laughs> He's not claiming injuries now. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Clearly the jury uh, found, you know, $10 million <laughs> worth of injuries that, that he suffered. Uh, so, y y you know, <laughs> he definitely suffered injuries. And, and people, I think, too, were under the impression that, oh, he said he had emotional distress you know it, it it caused him it caused him anxiety and stuff to be accused of these things well duh uh but that's not enough to get you over that hurdle having anxiety is is not in and of itself like a pathology you know everybody has anxiety that's normal and that is recoverable in a civil case um it, 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 if it doesn't rise to the level of you know being being a diagnosable medical condition that you are relying on to try to justify your damage claim, then there is no basis for that IME. Children's information and medical information are, are pretty much like the the holy grails of like the court is is not going to go there unless there is a really good reason to do that. So it's just it's just a bridge too far. Um, yeah. So yeah. You, you have to have a good justification. Simple anxiety is not it. PTSD because Johnny beat me. Yeah, that's going to be that, enough. That would that. Yeah, that. That would do it. So l let's switch gears for a sec while we're on mm -hmm. the topic of um, medical examinations. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Curry was one of them that, that, that performed the examinations. We'll talk about Dr. Hughes as well, but I wanted to focus on Dr. Curry because I was watching her cross-examination again. Um, mm -hmm. Such a masterful cross-examination by Elaine Bredehoff, I must say, you know, speaking, <laughs> speaking about the uh, muffins was a great defense. Um, Indeed. <laughs> Didn't that de land? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's Elaine's job to, to spin things, you know, and so to try to paint Dr. Curry as as biased, uh, as having prejudged the case, not having an open mind. I mean, that that is, I suppose, good lawyering. It helps if you have a basis to be making that type of accusation. Uh, but, you know, I, I guess if muffins are, are what you got, then muffins are, are what you work with. Muffins and amic cream, you know, what more do you need for a case? But... Uh, the, the thing that that I found that uh, was fascinating from the unsealed documents that I actually I don't think I've seen anybody anybody comment on it. Certainly Amber's team hasn't. I don't think I've I've gone into it um, just because I got distracted talking about other things. 
Uh, but there's some very interesting information from Dr. Curry describing uh, the stonewalling that she got from Dr. Hughes uh, and how Dr. Hughes was basically not wanting to provide a lot of her own data, her testing and, and things like that. Uh, there was a real process to try to get that out of her. Another thing that we learned was that uh, Dr. Curry was not allowed to do the same types of um, what Dr. Hughes had referred to as collateral interviews, uh, talking to the previous uh, therapists, friends, associates, acquaintances, things like that to get information about uh, the, the relationship and the abuse claims. Uh, Dr. Curry was specifically not allowed to do that based on an argument from Ben Rottenborn that basically was just nothing more than saying it's inappropriate for her to be able to do that. Judge Judge uh, Azkarati said, okay, and signed <laughs> off and agreed. So Dr. <laughs> Curry wasn't allowed to do this, not only the same type of evaluation that Dr. Hughes was, but as Dr. Hughes testified to, what is a very normal and expected and routine thing to do for that type of an evaluation. <laughs> so, you know, a, to the extent that a lot of the narrative from Amber's team has been about how bad Judge As Karate was and, you know, how, how terrible her rulings were and, and so forth, <laughs> Judge As Karate bent over backwards for Amber Heard at nearly every single stage of this case. Uh, and this is just another example of one where without any really good reason that I can see, she significantly limited Johnny's ability to, to get evidence that, that is pertinent, that's relevant to her ability to do that, e to do that evaluation. Uh, you know, weird how nobody's mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's 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 interesting you brought that up. We'll sidebar. We're gonna sidebar for a minute. Let's talk about just ask Ryan for a second. The second <laughs> statement: If you were the judge, would you have allowed that in? The second statement: The um the oh um this was a hoax. Amber and her friends got together, spilled a little wine. They roughed up the place. Called the call nine one one. Got their story huh? straight. Such. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, in my opinion, I mean, I have my opinions, but yeah. looking at that, do you think that is a statement of, yeah, this is fact or this is opinion? Well, I, I saw a lot of issue with the the um, actionability of these statements uh, for, for a lot of those reasons. Like you pointed out, because Adam Waldman is a lawyer... <laughs> He's Johnny's lawyer, he's Johnny's litigation lawyer, and he's making these statements while they are, you know, in and preparing for and recovering from the UK trial. These seem to me to be very clearly expressing a, a theory of the case, okay? This is how lawyers give an opening statement. This is what we think the evidence is going to prove. Uh, so, you know, that was one of the issues with it. Uh, the actual malice, Piece, you know, was another. I do not think that that bar was cleared. Uh, I, I thought that that was going to potentially be a, a strong issue for Johnny on appeal. No, you know, basis really to say that Adam thought that any of this was false. It <laughs> seems pretty clear he thought it was true because he took it to the LAPD and asked them to file perjury on it. Okay, you don't typically do that with uh, something that that you know is is false. Um, but yeah. Just a, a, a lot of a lot of you know potential potential problems with with how that got handled. The way that they sort of conflated, you know, he's Johnny's agent, but who who's the one that needs to have the actual malice? Does it need to be Johnny that has the actual malice? Does it need to be Adam Waldman that has the actual malice? It, it was all just very unclear uh, how, how that got resolved. It appeared to me that Judge Azkarati kind of just resolved it for Amber Heard as the path of least resistance. Mm. Um, but uh, I, I, I did have, yeah, some some disputes with some aspects of those rulings. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do. I do feel like uh, if that statement didn't make it in. I, I don't think the jury even on the, understood the actual malice part, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So they, I, I think they would have dismissed two of the statements just mm -hmm. based on that. Like, 
if it's not if it's not for the for the fact that that it was a hoax i think that would have done it because how do you prove that he was thinking the same thing adam woman was thinking i mean that's just that's just common sense like yeah. you know what i mean now that this you know um now that her her finding of the statement, which which was statement two, has not been overturned by a judge or anything like that. How binding do you think it is um, as a president? Can I say president or case law mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. someone can use to say, oh, because that lawyer um, was saying this in the media, they're now mm-hmm. liable. For example, Elaine went on a press tour and said that mm-hmm. Amber's broke. And now mm-hmm. we found in the insurance litigation not really so <laughs> uh, how binding is yeah. that would it work against yes. her in the insurance litigation <laughs> <laughs> great point <laughs> yeah you know so it doesn't the decision does not have it's not binding precedent on any court um things that happen in trial courts are, are not precedential for anybody uh it's typically only published opinions from courts of appeal and supreme courts that are are potentially binding on lower courts. That said, it's obviously an example, and it's an example that was very high profile that that got a lot of attention. And so the fact that something like this can happen is enough to, you know, probably cause some concern uh, among trial lawyers because you know, there there is some extent when you're representing a, a, a high profile public individual, somebody like Johnny Depp, uh, there is a PR component to what you're doing. And so lawyers, you know, play larger or smaller roles in, in that, depending on, you know, a lot of things, their comfort with it, um, their, you know, role in it. Uh, but the fact that this type of decision has happened, even though it's not like binding precedent, it's not something that people are going to be able to cite in another court and say, you have to do it this way because the Fairfax yeah, yeah. court did it that way. It's still an example that lawyers are going to see, oh, wow, if I talk about my client's litigation strategy, his theory of the case in 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 the court, uh, my client could end up liable for it. That's not a good place to be. So it could uh it could potentially you know encourage some attorneys you know who who are in the habit of making these types of public statements you know your your gloria all reds we can hope <laughs> maybe might be discouraged a little i'm sure you may have heard of the gabby patito case um i'm brian i'm brian laundry um, mm-hmm. believe it or yes. not it was actually used in the arguments there to get the judge mm-hmm. to you know um, yeah. Uh, see their side, and he was actually quoted and say, "Yeah, like Brian Laundry's um, lawyers, etc. Et you know, um, they um, they were making those statements through the lawyer, and I, I, and that's what really clicked. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa! It's mm-hmm. already taking effect. Like it's only been two months, like two or three yeah. months, and then the case. And like, so that's what really made me want to like really ask that question because I don't know how far this rubble hill is gonna go. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's something that a a higher judge would have to step in and be like, okay, okay, okay cool. We we got to uh, step in and you know stop this from being used as a persuasive uh, lo- uh, case law. Does that actually happen? I, and I think I'm using the word case law mis- mm-hmm. a, a bit misrepresented there, but but would it happen that a higher court would step in on their own volition and be like, actually, let's just strike that from the record or something like that? No. <laughs> no, it's not likely. It's not likely because, like you said, it is it is persuasive. Uh, it's an example. It's, it's something that people are aware of that that happened. And so the court can take that into account. It would really only be a problem if the court said, like, I don't have discretion to act because I have to follow what happened to Johnny Depp in Fairfax. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that would be a problem because, you know, that's not correct. <laughs> and so the judge, yeah. you know, need, needs to actually exercise their discretion the way that they can. Uh, but to just to just consider the fact that it happened, no, that's pretty commonplace, and and judges judges do that a lot. Uh, they're they're aware of other things that are going on and sort of the gestalt, you know, if you will, and they take that 
you know, sometimes into consideration when they're making their decisions. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, turning over to the insurance case, um, <laughs> because this one is very interesting. Uh, I want to talk about perjury for a second because that word came up as well, and mm-hmm. I, uh, there there is two things here. So, perjury. Mm-hmm. When <laughs> isn't it obvious? perjury where you're saying that you've donated that you couldn't donate money because you have to pay for your legal fees Mm -hmm. and this is very 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 verifiable but nothing is done what's the actual procedure like is perjury even enforced in in legal proceedings at all very rarely very rarely. I, I've seen it. Uh, so I had a perjury case that I handled once on appeal that had come out of a, a situation that, uh, you know, it was a criminal trial. Uh, the defendant had testified, given certain testimony that the state, you know, clearly did not agree with uh, and, and felt that the defendant had deliberately fabricated it. So they did charge him for perjury and, and got a conviction for that. So it does happen, but it's exceedingly rare. It's the only time in, you know, 16 years I've, I've seen something like that. And of course, that's coming out of a criminal case. Uh, Prosecutors are the ones who decide whether or not to charge perjury. And prosecutors take their own cases quite a bit more personally than they take, you know, some rando amica lawyers, (laughs) you know, civil case. So (laughs) it's just it's one of those things that is not necessarily going to be to be a huge priority. I think it should, you know, personally, because it just reflects very badly on your court. You make the court look terrible when somebody can come in and just completely disrespect it, disrespect the oath, disrespect the process, disrespect, you know, the the purpose of of being there at all, disrespect the judge uh, and, and, you know, not have any sort of consequence for that. At some point, you know, that undermines the system. In this particular case, it may very well be that they just are like, well, look, nobody believed her anyway. It doesn't really matter. She got a she got a ten million dollar judgment against her. So obviously it's it's not like it uh, caused any any severe harm. Uh you know, maybe if she'd gotten off, would it be a different situation? I I, I don't know. I, I still kind of doubt it just because it's a civil case yeah. and, and just a, a sense that it's not really that important. It's a private dispute. People are going to, f- you know, fight cheap sometimes. And I, I don't know. It's it's a it's a political decision to charge yeah. or not charge. I don't mean that in a, you know, left wing, right wing kind of way. Yeah, I yeah. just mean that it's discretionary. It's up yeah. to the prosecutor to get to do it or not. And so he's going to be thinking about why would I do this? What's yeah. the reason to do it? What's the upside? They've already had a lot to deal with in their court because of Amber Heard. So I, I can't say that I necessarily blame <laughs> them for not wanting to have round two. <laughs> Neither can I. I can't. <laughs> Imagine calling her back in court to try and explain why she was saying this. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and you know she will have an explanation. You, I mean, you know, we've already seen. It doesn't matter how ridiculous it is or how implausible it is. There will be an explanation. <laughs> Probably it will involve, you know, identifying some witness who will back her up, who has never shown up in court, you know, and never will show up in court. And uh, that's that's just how we've seen her operate for years now. Going off that and back into the documents, why is it in motion? Yeah, so a motion in limine is a pre-trial motion that is dealing with how the trial is going to be conducted. And so uh, most of the time it has to do with evidentiary rulings. It's you're getting kind of a, a, a pre pre ruling from the judge on what the playing field is going to look like in terms of what you're going to be able to bring and, and what types of arguments that, that you're going to be able to make. So a lot of this stuff, when it's fairly straightforward, they like to deal with it ahead of trial because you need to know if I'm not going to be able to introduce this evidence, then I don't want to tell the jury that they're going to hear about it in my opening statement. You know, we, we want to deal with, we want to know that ahead of time and, and we can craft things around it. So that's really what the motions in limine were in this particular case. They were questions about specific pieces of evidence and whether they were going to be allowed uh, to be to be admitted or not. 
let's say a motion in limine was settled you know it was decided uh, um that this is not going to go forward etc but mm-hmm. the lawyer brings it back up during trial mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it happened in this case miss mm-hmm. the star attorney miss elaine bredoff amazing she knows exactly what she's doing she tries her hardest um <laughs> uh, it, like, uh, it, what's the procedure here because shouldn't lawyers face repercussions for bring up settled disputes before the trial like what what goes on if they were to bring up like she brought up her paying her own legal fees knowing that mm-hmm. it was or it was the insurance doing it Mm-hmm. Well, so there, there's a lot going on with that. Uh, so, so first off, as far as just the kind of relitigating the 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 ruling in limine, that in and of itself is okay. Uh, rulings in limine are understood to be preliminary. They aren't even necessarily, you know, the 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 final decision. Typically, if they're excluding evidence, they will be. But it's often the case that during the course of the trial, things can change. The door can be opened to something that was previously inadmissible because of just how stuff unfolded at trial. So it's not really that unusual or or even really inappropriate to ask the court to revisit it. If you don't have a good basis and you're being annoying, doing it a lot, you know, you you could you could bug the judge. But, (laughs) you know, that's that's just, you know, a matter of trial style, I guess. But the, the, the bigger concern about Elaine making this representation about the payment of the attorney's fees is the fact that it appears to not be true. And the fact that Elaine would have known that it was not true because she would know who is paying her invoices. Uh, y- you know, and so... Oh, I didn't consider that. I did not even consider that's, that. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a problem. Uh, there, you know, would would potentially you know be a situation where she could you know need to maybe make an offer of proof about what are what are you relying on to say that that she made this made this payment because we have learned from the insurance litigation that travelers has paid the attorney fees they say plain and black and white they they paid all the attorney fees for elaine bredhoff uh so it's not impossible that Amber Heard paid some attorney fees. Uh, you know, she she had Eric George on board before she had ever um, submitted the claim to her insurance. So she certainly, you know, had some fees related to that. Uh, she did was the witness in the UK. That's not really part of the lawsuit. She chose to do that. She wasn't compelled to do that. It was something that she undertook. And so an expense that she incurred of her own volition in order to take that position. Um, So, you know, kind of some gray area there about whether that would count or not. But that said, even if you lump all of these things together, you really better be prepared to prove that that's $6 million, which I'm quite skeptical of, uh, because we saw, you know, at least going up to trial in this case, how how much they, they did for $6 million. So... That seems highly unlikely to me. And that's that's problematic for Elaine Bredehoft because that is potentially, you know, being dishonest to the court is not a good look for a lawyer at all. That is unethical. That is um, something that you are not allowed to do under the rules of professional responsibility that can get you in trouble with the Bar Association. That's the type of thing that you you don't find out if it happens. Those proceedings are, are confidential. Um, so you, you would, you know, basically not know if, if, uh, there had been any type of complaint or investigation or something like that about that. Um, but that's, you know, if I were Elaine and I had made that statement and I were not prepared with invoices for $6,000 or $6 million canceled checks, et cetera, to back up that Amber Heard had paid that, uh, I'd be a little bit concerned for myself, for my my own future and my own reputation for having made that statement. So, wow. I did not expect that kind of breakdown. And the reason why I'm looking in so much disbelief because because I, 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 I got to ask, is this a case of being overzealous for your clients or acting under duress? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, why not both? (laughs) (laughs) So going on that, um, when you read the, when you read the judgment, um, from the judge, um, and, 
and he was kind of justifying his position in regards to Amber Heard's day. I think it was day ten to day twelve testimony of something like that. And um, mm-hmm. well, not testimony really, just cr- cr- just cross examination and redirect. So um, it's a bit different there. But when you read the w- the witness statements and the cross examination, what were going through your mind in terms of what she was uh, putting out there? Did you believe at any point that this was somebody that was that you could say, okay, I'll I'll give the benefit of the doubt because of for whatever reason? Did you even consider giving her the benefit of the doubt in any way? Oh, absolutely. When I first read the witness statement and and read the evidence, I'm I'm going to be receptive to it. Uh, I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to shut that out entirely. The problem was the inconsistencies with it, the problems with it that were demonstrated over the course of the trial. The you know the the big like obvious one was the changing the story. You know, between between days, uh, she she realized that there was photographic evidence that was going to contradict it was going to prove that what she was saying could not have happened and so her response to that was to come back into court and oh oops i forgot i need to change the dates which was funny she did the same thing in in virginia as well um but she did it she did it very obviously in the uk and it was also very obvious because whitney did it as well um whitney made the same you know Sudden, suddenly remembered, you know, that, that these dates were, were different than we had originally said they were in, in our witness statements. So a, a lot of little things like that, just the way that, that uh, she did always have, you know, some explanation for everything. It's just, it just doesn't, it doesn't come across as, as credible, you know, when, when you're never at fault, you've never done anything wrong, everything is the other person's fault, and you always have an explanation for the stuff that makes you look bad, like, you know, shitting in someone's bed. Uh, <laughs> then, I mean, you just come across as, as not a particularly credible person. So to me, even in the black and white transcripts, it was pretty clear what was going on. And especially because, you know, she wasn't in isolation. There was a whole universe of evidence in the case to take into account. The first thing that had caught my attention that made it into the public record, uh, besides, you know, the, the audio recordings, was the witness statement of Tara Roberts, the um, caretaker in the Bahamas. She's the one who had witnessed the screaming fights, Amber throwing stuff. Uh, the time that she was chasing him down in, in his little, you know, like golf cart thing or, or whatever. He's trying to get away from her and and, and she won't let him. Uh, and she's doing all this stuff apparently openly in front of the staff. I mean, that's that's quite a visual, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the way that she described it. It really painted a picture of of this relationship. And so I found that type of thing, you know, pretty persuasive. Yeah. Uh, don't really see a motivation for all of these people to lie. I mean, that's quite a conspiracy. That's a little bit of a complicated explanation to my taste. Uh, you know, I must Occam's Razor. My job. I must <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, much simpler explanation from my perspective is Amber looks like a liar. Her story is inconsistent with everybody else's testimony. Probably the reason why is because Amber's lying. (laughs) All the documents that was proffered um, during that little break that they had, I think it was in, um, sorry, not, not, not break, but I think it was before Amber went on to, um, to testify, they had a proffer or whatever, or something. I, 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 I don't know when, but they, but they had, but they had a proffer, and all those exhibits and depositions came out. Did you have a chance to examine those? Oh, uh, yeah. So what you're talking about, I think, is uh, after the judgment came down, uh, Elaine had filed. Amber's attorney, Elaine Breedhoft, had filed a, a notice of filing that identified all of these depositions and other pieces of evidence uh, that she was lodging basically in the court for purposes of appeal. So those became public record when she filed them. Uh, So I contacted the Fairfax County clerks to to kind of find out what what the status was going to be with those. And at that point, uh, the answer was they're available for inspection in, in Fairfax County, but the clerks were not going to make copies of them. 
so you you basically had to go there to be physically present to view them. So I didn't follow up on that. Uh, I, I was aware of it, but you know I'm over here in Washington State. I'm a few thousand miles from Fairfax. It wasn't going to be you know quick quick jog around the block. Check that out on my lunch break. Um, <laughs> But I have learned, uh, apparently, subsequently, that during the appeal process, uh, some folks on Amber's team or the amicus, one of the amicus organizations, uh, I believe, uh, actually filed uh, for a writ, a writ of uh, mandamus against Judge As Karate and the Fairfax County clerks to basically compel them to release copies, to make copies of, of these documents so that uh, you know, pe people could people could get them, and so based on that, my understanding now is yeah, all of those things are are available to copy. Anybody can call up the court and uh, and ask for a copy. Uh, the reason I haven't done that is because my expectation is that the costs for that are going to be in at least the five figures, <laughs> uh, you know, $10,000 minimum and, and probably, you know, more in like the 30 to 50 ballpark. So it's an awful lot of money that, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> anyone, yeah, should be financing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you said something in, in regards to a writ what is that um what is the rip magna so I, I, a writ I, is I, I, can't, I can't i i can't say the word sorry i can't yeah I can't <laughs> a writ of mandamus it's a legal process where basically you're asking a, a, a higher judge to compel a government official to take action and so a writ of mandamus could be against any government official it could be against the governor it could be against you know the department of motor vehicles in this particular case it was against judge as karate and the fairfax county county clerk and it was just basically saying you have a legal obligation to do this thing that you're not doing. So you higher court need to compel them to do that. Um, okay. So that apparently was granted. I, I, I'm going to close off on, I think I'm going to close off on this. Um, Elaine Bredehoft what, uh, said that Bonnie Jacobs was going to testify into mm -hmm. the case. Uh, sorry, in the case. But I read through a lot of documents and maybe it's, it's because... I don't have um, the knowledge of how it all works because I did not see any deposition from her, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I didn't see the deposition transcript from Erin Falardi as well. But mm -hmm. we know that, sh that she had deposition. So is it possible for someone to sit trial or even for a lawyer to even make that statement that someone will sit trial without a deposition? Uh, yes, it is. It is possible. However, I do believe Bonnie Jacobs was deposed and I do believe that her deposition was also included in that notice of, of filing that uh, that Elaine did. It's just that uh, the fans of Amber who went and, you know, selectively cherry picked no which of those way. documents they were that going to get didn't get that one. So Heinz, get in touch with Fairfax County Circuit Court and order a copy of Bonnie Jacobs's deposition. You'll be able to get it. And that could have some some illuminating <laughs> answers for you. Whoa, whoa! <laughs> that is, I didn't even connect. I didn't even connect it to like that. Jesus Christ! <laughs> nah. Okay. Yeah, the, the 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 Google documents that you're referring to. Um, I I did see those, and it's a very small selection of yeah. what was contained in that notice of filing. So there is a lot more still there in the Fairfax Court that it's public record, but it hasn't been you know published by you know somebody like me with a website or, yeah, or somebody yeah, yeah. you know putting it on google docs or whatever uh it's it's just there um for for people to go to go look at until unless and until someone decides they want to put it on the internet um <laughs> uh deaf fans paid the court fees for the release of documents from herd's therapist dr don hughes congratulations good job everybody good job everybody on that i literally thought this was it and this was all that was given out oh no oh my no no God. you must not assume good faith on the part of these <laughs> uh on the part of these crisis pr actors <laughs> wait so that's actually that's even worse to even learn now so even with their own documents that they procured and put out selectively mm -hmm. It yes. still looked so bad for Amber yes. Heard. So, that was so the bad. the best they could get, <laughs> and it was still awful. 
<laughs> oh my god i cannot believe and so what now I'm... you know why the misinformation has been so necessary has been such a key part of the strategy because the truth does not favor amber heard and at everybody all. knows it like I said, I'm an I'm I'm an advocate for transparency. Uh, I think it's important for this process to, to be out there for everybody to be able to see how it unfolded, and so that they can exercise their own independent judgment. It's when things are kept back or or kept behind closed doors or or whatever that it's so much easier to propagandize what is really going on. You can get to selectively. Uh, you know, report things or, or distort it or whatever, because people don't have access to that source information to be able to force you to be honest with it. And so in this day and age, when unfortunately, for better or worse, traditional media has just become an arm of PR. I mean, it's just there to promote a narrative for whatever reason, whether it's because they're actually getting paid for it or just because they have, you know, political or um, ideological types of types of motivations for it that they're type that they're, they're trying to push. We're just long past the era where the, the, the mainstream media is a reporter of facts. And that's what I did <laughs> you know yeah. to be perfectly frank i got yeah. the information and i published it so everybody can see it <laughs> um and, and so perhaps that's why the mainstream media you know is so resentful about that step because it exposes them for the uh little profitas that they are people reading these documents should it be something that that, sh that should be used as basis to say oh my mind is now changed Amber is the, it was the true victim. I've seen the documents. I have seen the arguments for um, nudes being, you know, threatened to be aired live in court. Like, what do you say to that? Like, uh, maybe I'm just being crazy by thinking that's insane, but well, what do you think? Yeah, well, I, I think that you would have to uh, severely misunderstand these documents to read them and, and come away thinking that they, give Amber Heard any significant, you know, victory at all. And you brought up the, the thing with the nudes. Um, they, they tried to argue that Johnny Depp was going to introduce uh, Amber Heard's nudes. Uh, no, it was Elaine Bredhoft who brought up the fact that Amber Heard had nudes uh, because <laughs> she was asking the court to exclude those. And Johnny Depp's response was, look at our evidence list. We don't have them on there. We never intended to proffer them. We don't intend to proffer them. That's, you know, not, not part of our litigation plan. And lo and behold, he's correct. The exhibit list is a matter of public record. No, they, they aren't on there. He was never going to proffer anything like that. So... Again, it's just been a tool for, for people to propagandize. Uh, and some of that, I think, is is knowing that not a lot of people are, are going to want to go and, and read through 10,000 pages of, of legal documents and, and try to make sense out of them themselves. Uh, and, and so they have that opportunity to potentially be able to you know spin it misrepresent it distort it cherry pick it etc cetera, etc cetera, take it out of context make it look like something that it's not uh and and so that's just kind of a reality of of the media environment that we live in and and kind of the 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 civics educational environment that that we live in you know, um, it's unfortunate. I'd like to be in a place where everybody would want to read the documents, would want to, you know, see these things for themselves and, and have the ability to, to understand them. That's my goal in, in publishing them and having them available so that anybody out there can come in and look and see for yourselves and, and educate yourself, learn what was going on uh, in those final days, basically leading up to the trial which is what most of the unsealed documents uh, were. Uh, but, you know, again, PR is going to PR, you know, if it wasn't the unsealed documents, it was going to be something else that they were going to spend because they're being paid to rehabilitate Amber Heard. So <laughs> they need to come up with something. Those of us who had, in fact, read the documents are reading some of these claims about what's in the documents. And it's just, huh, would you like to give me a page citation to that? Because I can page and document cite to you, you know, a lot of what is in those unsealed files. And yeah, yeah there's just a lot of, a lot of crazy claims out there.
Yeah, I think the Daily Beast was the worst one where they even they even they they edited this. But I can't believe they actually alleged that Dr. Hughes, Spiegel, uh the IT guy that I can't remember the name of at this point, Julian Arker, that's it. And um I think there was one more that I'm missing out. They didn't test they said they yeah. didn't they testify that, yeah. that 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 yeah. that literally stopped them from doing it. I was like Yeah. Whoa yeah oh like Jesus. no and, and and that that was just um that was such a, a cherry on top of the sunday that has been the media coverage of, of depth versus hurt i mean that really that really summarizes it or the you know when when the person uh made the comment about about uh jason momoa you know testifying oh. at the trial because somebody had made a a, a joke a TikTok joke uh and somebody saw that and actually thought that that was real uh the the media has just lost so much of its credibility when when it comes to this type of coverage and it's been a problem for a long time it's it's one of the reasons why i'm kind of sticking around with commentary and youtube and stuff like that because the state of legal journalism has been trash absolute yeah. gutter trash for for decades frankly uh, and, and so there is a real need for uh, honest, informed, educated commentary to be able to interpret the stuff that is happening in a way that is fair uh, and not just a way that is there to distort it to promote a narrative. <laughs> Andrew Burkhart, thank you so much for sitting down with me and discussing this because I, I yeah, like uh, <laughs> I, I'm overwhelmed and I, I am grateful <laughs> and um, yeah, like I, I, I have admired your work for so, so long. The way you just, you're uninten I keep saying this, you're unintentionally funny. Like it's just, you don't, even, you don't want to be, you just, <laughs> you're just factually and I'm just like, you should be a comedian. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I mean, I tend to have a humorous view of the world because you can laugh or you can cry, and crying is no fun. It's very depressing. So I've always been one to find the humor and stuff. Uh, I've enjoyed getting to know Johnny Depp through the case, through his text, through you know what what we saw of his testimony and stuff and learning that you know johnny depp has a pretty dark sense of humor himself <laughs> so uh you know i feel okay about having that type of perspective i, I think it's healthy it helps you get through hard times oh, thank you oh, oh. <laughs> i i look forward to seeing more of your content i think it was amazing that uh that johnny that johnny's team even watched that was a surprise to me. Like when you mentioned it on one of your videos that you were even going to hold back on even giving commentary during the, during the appeal, which just speaks to your legal prowess. So um, keep doing what you're doing because honestly, like uh, I, I, I believe you were the only one that really, really highlighted how amazing of an, of, of, of an attorney Elaine is cross-examining um, Isaac Baruch. I think that was, amazingly well well put you don't have so much grace it gave me a lot of hope that i can really go into this career field and maybe maybe make it one day <laughs> you see where the bar is okay <laughs> you can clear it <laughs> <laughs> it's a hurdle not not a high jump but yeah yeah, yeah. it's like a twig lying in the grass <laughs> yeah, not even a hurdle, just try not to kick it <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna hand you here before my sides go, before my sides go. thank you so much <laughs> Oh, it's been my pleasure. I really enjoy the work you're doing, and I hope you keep it up as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs>